Everybody enjoy the Thanksgiving? It was a great opportunity to practice last week's message about not judging, right? <laughs> Come together to the table with lots of people. And uh, we put our turkey in at halftime on the Bills game. And for a little while, I wasn't sure we were going to have anything to be grateful for. But <laughs> as it turns out, gratitude just means you're actually paying attention. Oh, there are good things in our lives that it's easy to miss. You know, the hard and the painful things are kind of obvious. But uh, it, when, we're, when we're grateful, it shows that we're paying attention. This morning, we're uh, closing out the section of uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is about to complete his message, and he's actually not going to do it with an inspirational pep talk. He's going to close out this message in a really unusual way. And uh, when we look at this passage of Scripture, there's a lot of ways to, to misunderstand it. And uh, there's a voice that we hear inside of our head judging us a lot, and we can bring that into this passage. And what we will wind up with is a, is a misunderstanding of who God is, but also how we interact with him. And uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to look at the warnings of Jesus, the warnings of Jesus. Now, um, there are lots of things that come with warnings. Uh, I looked up online, I googled warnings humor. And uh, nothing that I found was appropriate to share with you, so I don't know what to tell you about that. But whenever we take a medication, there's warnings of potential side effects. Uh, there's warnings on the food we buy, on the automobiles we buy, on, the, on any technology that we buy. Uh, we're also warned that things might not work for us like they did for someone else. You know, weight loss products uh, uh, or, or investment opportunities. Uh, your experience might differ. Warning, your experience might differ from some other people. Uh, warnings about all kinds of things, and Jesus warns us. So in Matthew, and he's actually going to illustrate this warning in three ways. A warning about two roads, a warning about two trees, and a warning about two houses. In Matthew uh, chapter 7, beginning in verse 13, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Narrow gates, narrow roads. Uh, we are told frequently in our society that all roads uh, lead to the same place. But I do not believe that all roads lead to the same place. And Jesus seems to indicate he does not believe all roads lead to the same place. And someone might ask, well, how do you know? And the answer is because we're not all in the same place. There are paths that we can take that can have profound effects on us personally and our relationships and our, our employment opportunities, our educational opportunities. We can look back through our life and see a lot of opportunities where if we could revisit a decision, we might have exercised a different option because now we know more about what that option actually produced in our lives. And so before us, there are a couple of options, and, and one has to do with this narrow gate and a narrow road. And, and the idea that Jesus wants to see, he's, he's going to show, in fact, it's going to end this chapter with uh, using a word that winds up in the Greek uh, word multiple times in this passage, and the word is practice, practice, practice. What does it mean to practice? And this, as it turns out, is a big deal because lots of us will try things, which is not exactly the same thing as practicing something. You know, some of us will test something. You know, every once in a while, my, my wife will will make something new for dinner that I have not seen her make before. And immediately my mind starts thinking of what emergency backup options I could come up with if this doesn't turn out as well as she had hoped. And so, but practice. If you've been involved in sports, you know what it's like to practice. If you've been involved in some kind of uh, developing of a musical talent, you know what it's like to practice. 
What is this concept of practice? And what Jesus is showing us is that there's a narrow gate, but there's also a narrow road. And the, and the narrow gate actually has to do with a personal decision we make. This is really interesting. The gate is really narrow so that only you can get through it. In fact, it kind of shimmy through it because there's not a lot of space there. You can't go through this gate with anybody else. You have to decide for yourself whether Jesus is going to be the option you exercise for your rescue, for your salvation, for your hope, for your future. And other people can't do that for you as much as they would like to. And you can't do it for other people as much as you would like to. And you can't bring a lot of stuff with you as much as you would like to. You just kind of squeeze through this gate because you are making a very personal decision that Jesus is the option. But it doesn't stop there. Now there's a narrow road, a narrow gate and a narrow road. And this is what some people think. You kind of come through the gate with Jesus and then, then you walk on the narrow road and and hopefully you don't veer off because you'll wind up someplace other than heaven. And Jesus doesn't say that if you stay on the narrow road, that's how you get to heaven. You want to know how you get to heaven? The narrow gate. That's how you get to heaven. So then what is the narrow road? And the narrow road has to do with how you practice the life of Jesus. I'm accepting the life that Jesus offers me. That's the gate. Now I'm going to try to live the life that Jesus calls me to. That's the road. Think of it like this. The narrow road is a way of life rather than a way to life. And what do we do? There's things we practice. We set up our minds in, in our faith journey sometimes as though we either succeed or we fail, but practice isn't like succeeding or failing. Practice is learning. Like there's lots of things we don't do well when we start, but we practice and we get better at it. And if you practice running, you build your endurance. If you practice a sport, you improve your efficiencies and your skills. If you practice instruments and, and, and musicality, you improve your vocal capacity and you, you improve all these. It takes practice to do that. And, and we understand. So what is practice for the believer? And Jesus has been telling us through this whole message. You practice blessing other people. Well, there's a narrow road because there's not a lot of blessers out there. There's a, there's a lot of mockers. There's a lot of cursers. The, there's a lot of, of, of degraders and, and discouragers. But there's not a lot of people who actually bless others as they go along the way. And, and what else do we practice? We practice managing our anger. I, I don't see a lot of people practicing managing anger. I, I see a lot of people practicing venting anger. And some people have that down to a science. But to practice managing your anger, or to practice honoring your commitments. Now, some people go, oh, I figured that out. I just don't make any commitments. Your inability to make a commitment does not make you spiritually superior. Jesus didn't say you're more honest if you're unwilling to make a commitment. You can't practice anything by refusing to commit. You make a commitment, and then you practice keeping your word. And you practice loving your enemies when you'd rather demonize them. And you practice being a calm presence in the face of the chaos around you. Well, I try, but good. So try again and again and again. Some of you, when you were heading into your Thanksgiving dinner with your family and your friends, you had to coach yourself up a little bit, didn't you? You had, to, you had to say, all right, I'm not going to take the bait when, when uncle so-and-so brings this up. I'm not going down that road with him. Right. You know why? Because that's a broad road. You're going to stand on their road. You're going to bless. You're going to practice being a calm influence. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that there's a narrow gate. We choose him. And then he's saying there's a narrow road because there's not a lot of people who are practicing blessing, not a lot of people who are loving their enemies, not a lot of people who are managing their anger, not a lot of people who are trying to be a calm presence in the midst of chaos, not a lot of people who are willing to make and keep the commitments that they make. Narrow road. So, so well, I've made mistakes, right? You're practicing. You're going to make mistakes, but you keep practicing. So that's the 
the warning of the two roads, but then he goes on to tell us about a warning of two trees. <clears throat> two trees. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by your fruit, you will recognize them. We're thinking about practice, so what does Jesus say? He said part of being on the narrow road is learning to discern the truth about spiritual leaders. And this is what's interesting, is that wolves don't just come in like wolves. They, they come in like dressed up like sheep. They look like they fit in until you find out they've got a different kind of teeth than the other sheep. What's interesting here is that the word for uh, uh, fruit, every tree bears, that, that word in the Greek is the exact same word as practice. What Jesus is saying is that spiritual leaders also have a practice. There's a way that they go about things. And what he says is to watch out for them. This is interesting because he doesn't say to do anything other than watch out for them. There are some people who've made it their mission in life. They're kind of called heresy hunters. Some of them have YouTube channels. I don't recommend that you search that out because they try to find every spiritual leader who said something they don't agree with or who they can find a verse of scripture that disagrees with them or there's some inconsistency in their life and then they just blast them all over the place. And That's not what Jesus says to do. He says, just be on the lookout for these folks. You need to be able to discern. How can you discern? You can't tell by looking. How can you discern? You can't tell by how many followers they have, by how many likes they get on social media, by how many subscribers. Those are all terrible ways to discern whether a spiritual leader is valid or invalid. Well, how can you tell? By the fruit that their life produces. And Jesus said, bad trees can't really produce good fruit. Good trees don't produce bad fruit. So what is he telling us? He's saying there's a way that they practice. Do they practice what they preach? Do they treat people with dignity and respect? Do they, when they fail, approach that with humility? Or do they blame others for it? How are they living out their life? Are they trying to control others or are they trying to lead others to Jesus? This, as it turns out, is a really big deal in Scripture. There have always been false teachers and false prophets, and Scriptures replete with all kinds of advice about them. Here's just some. In 2 Timothy, this is what Paul writes. He says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. What is Paul doing? He's telling us something about a technique, a strategy of false teachers. And that is rather than focusing on truth, they come up with myth. What's a myth? It's kind of an exaggerated story. It's, it's a fabrication. It's fictional. It might reflect something about a truth, but the goal is, is to make something up. It's, it's a myth. And what he's saying is that there are people who will make things up and exaggerate them. It, it, if you're a pastor, I, I can tell you it's a constant source of temptation, constant source of temptation. When pastors get together, they'll, they'll talk about interesting things and not interesting things. And one of the not interesting things they'll talk about, they'll ask, so, so how many people did you have last Sunday? And you know what the tendency is? The tendency is to round up. 
instead of 56, about 500. <laughs> it's just amazing how, how I, 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 I talked to a pastor who had more people saved in the last year in their church than lived in their city. I'm trying, how did you manage that? That's really impressive. How did you pull that off? Really interesting. Round, rounding up. I was with a, a pastor who was talking about our church. I was just standing there listening. I wasn't saying anything. And, and he told somebody else how many people attended our church. And he shorted us by 150. And I so wanted to correct that. Why? Why does that matter? When we exaggerate something, what we're saying is we're not grateful for what it is that God did. That's not good. Uh, Acts, the 20th chapter said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise, distort the truth, listen to this, to draw disciples, to draw away disciples after them. False teachers have a tendency of drawing people to themselves instead of pointing people to Jesus. And Paul says that's not good. In, in uh, 2 Peter, it says, but there were also false prophets among the people just as there were false teachers among you. And they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. They're not denying that there is a Lord. They're just denying that, that Jesus has the right to be sovereign over their lives. Bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct. So they live outside the rules. They've got excuses for why they're allowed certain things that maybe other people shouldn't do. They, their depraved conduct will bring a, a way of truth into dispute. So because they step out of bounds, the church is constantly looked down on. And people think, yeah, they're just like everybody else. Well, first of all, we are. Christianity is not about being better than anybody. Christianity is about recognizing that I'm not good enough on my own and I need all the help that God has for me. Does that make sense? In their greed, there it is. They want more. That's their mantra in life. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. What God has given is never enough. What they have is never enough. They always need more. And then 1 John 4, the Apostle John writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's not just a few of them. So we have to test. We have to discern what's the mechanism, what's the fruit of their lives. Are they lifting up Jesus or are they lifting themselves? Do they have to exaggerate in order to be credible? And Jesus says this is a problem. He goes on to staying with the same theme. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's interesting because they're saying Lord to Jesus. He's not talking about people who are often some kind of aberrant, occultic-like faith. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Listen to that. Only the one who does the will of my Father. So what's that? Well, it's not what these people think it is, because look what they say. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that there are people who approach their faith and even exercise leadership, and because they're able to take the name of Jesus and do things that seem to work, 
that somehow that is what faith is about. And what Jesus is wanting them to understand, the will of God is that you would know him and be known by him. The will of God is that you would be with him, not just do things for him. We can turn spirituality and faith into a to-do list instead of a relationship. And there's lots of people that if you ask them, how do you know for sure that you have a right relationship with God, they will point to all the things that they have done for God or for someone else. And Jesus says, they don't get it. The narrow road focuses more on being with Jesus than doing for Jesus. Does that make sense? So then he talks about two houses. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew against and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It's absolutely amazing how everything in this story is exactly the same. The rain is the same, the streams rising are the same, the wind is the same, the houses are the same. What's different is what they're built on. It's also amazing to me how often people approach spirituality as a way to avoid storms in life. That if you read your Bible enough and if you pray enough and if you attend places like this enough and if you're generous enough that somehow no evil will ever befall you, that, that you, everything will always go well for you, your family will always be healthy, your children will always make right choices, your employment will always be secure, your, your house will never wear down or wear out in any way, your body will not get old. How many know? That just can't be true. Jesus is incredibly honest. He doesn't say, if you follow me and practice my words, you can avoid all the storms. That's the wrong question. The question is not, how can I avoid storms? The question is, how can I withstand the storms that are coming? Jesus is honest. In this world, you are going to face challenges. You are going to have hard times. You're going to go through some difficult circumstances. And the good news for you is, is that the storm you face in your life does not have to be the end of you if you've put my words into practice because you will be on something solid. I mean, we're, in a, we're in an expanded facility that, that took quite a bit of money to, to, to build. What I can tell you is 24% of that entire cost, 24%, was in the infrastructure. It was in, in, in the, the things underneath, the foundations, the site work that had to be done to hold everything else up. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying, don't just be inspired by what you heard me say. Don't just be emotionally moved by what you heard me say. Practice it. You're going down your road in life and, and there's someone being stupid at spectacular levels. So, wow, that's a level of stupidity. That, And what do we want to do? We want to take out our camera and put it on YouTube. And he says, what if you could bless instead of mock or curse? What if when you're heading into a situation where you know there are going to be people who say things that are going to get under your skin, you know who they are, and you set yourself in, in place before you go in, and I have decided that I'm going to walk through this meeting, I'm going to walk through this conversation, and I am not going to vent my anger, I'm going to manage my anger. Or you walk in and you say, I know this is a situation of chaos. And quite honestly, I feel a lot of anxiety myself. But I'm going to walk in and I'm going to practice being a calm presence in the midst of chaos. And I'm asking Jesus to help me do that. I'm going to pray prayers that are not designed to, imp 
to get to the attention or the approval of other people. But just because I know God is listening, they might be fast and they might be short, but they're going to be emotionally authentic and I'm just going to trust God. And this is how we practice day by day. We just keep going through these steps day by day. It's absolutely amazing when you practice like that what kind of rock you are building your life on. And then when the storms come, you're not destroyed. You're not. Ask the worship team to come out. This is how Jesus ends this talk. He says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, a very interesting phrase, we're going to see it four more times in the Gospel of Matthew. Every time Jesus gives a major discourse, a major instruction, it concludes with this, when Jesus finished saying these things, it happens five times, what is Matthew doing? If you know anything about the history of the Old Testament and of God's people, their great liberator, their great savior, their great leader was Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. They're attributed to him. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And what Matthew is saying is we have a new Moses. He sees the bondages that we live in. He sees the fear that drives our hearts and makes our decisions for us. And he has come to rescue us and to bring us out of slavery and to lead us through a barren wasteland unto God's intended purpose for our life. So, well, what is the broad road? You don't have to make any decision to be on the broad road. Just go along. It's what everybody's doing. Don't question anything. Don't think for yourself. Just go along. Our culture has a very strong stream. And that's all we have to do. Just go along. Or, or, we could take a narrow gate. This is what he says. When he finished these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he's taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. If you bow your heads for a moment, I got a couple questions for you. What will you practice? What practice would you like to start? Would you like to be a person who blesses rather than curses? Who blesses rather than mocks? Who blesses rather than puts it down? Would you like to be a person who prays for rather than talks about? Who prays for rather than talks about? Would you like to be a person who brings peace with you into any room you walk into? instead of constantly being affected by the storms that already exist in there? Do you want to be the kind of person who when you see the storms coming, you do not fear? It's not because you like storms. It's because you have been practicing the way of Jesus. And Jesus has never lost anybody in his way. Heavenly Father, I ask you right now, Help us put your words into practice in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.